morning and welcome to our final virtual Latin lecture in Field Series 2020 brought to you by the Holocaust Museum of Houston. My name is Flor Di Masi, CEO of Global Speak Translations, and tonight we will be providing language interpretation services in Spanish for this event. In order to, in order to access the Spanish channel, please select the icon in form of a globe at the bottom right corner of your screen. Select the language preference, either English or Spanish, and be sure to select mute original audio to avoid hearing feedback or both languages. Enjoy the program. Buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos a nuestra última serie de conferencias y películas virtuales del mes de la herencia 2020 traído a ustedes por el Museo del Holocausto en Houston. Yo soy Flor Di Masi, gerente general de Global Speak Traducciones y esta noche estaremos proporcionando interpretación simultánea al español de este evento. Para seleccionar el idioma de español, favor de seleccionar el icono de interpretación en forma de mundo en la parte inferior derecha de la pantalla. Seleccione el idioma de su preferencia y asegúrese de poner modo silencio audio original para evitar escuchar la presentación en ambos idiomas. Que disfrute de este evento. Thank you, Flor, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Dr. Michelle Tovar. I am Associate Director of Education here at Holocaust Museum Houston. We would like to thank our partner, Global Speak Translation Services, for interpreting tonight's lecture and upcoming events. Tonight's event will be recorded and accessible through the Boniac Center YouTube channel. Holocaust Museum Houston stands in solidarity with the Black community and recognizes the importance of the Black Lives Matter movement. We would also like to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day, Dia de la Raza, and acknowledge the importance of decolonizing museums and amplifying Indigenous history. By doing so, we honor and celebrate the past, present, and future of Indigenous communities. Tonight's presentation is, re is pre-recorded and will be followed with a live Q&A with Dr. Gonzalez. We ask that you please submit your questions in the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many questions as we can by the end of the presentation. Please remember to mute your original audio from the globe tab on your screen so you do not have both English and Spanish during the presentation. Tonight we are hosting Dr. Gabriela Gonzalez for the last lecture of our Latinx Heritage Month series. She is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Texas at San Antonio, where she teaches courses on U.S.-Mexico borderlands, Latinx history, women's history, and historical methods. She received her Ph.D. in U.S. history from Stanford University in 2005 and is a Ford Foundation Diversity Fellow. Welcome, Dr. Gabriela Gonzalez. Thank you for being here this evening. So we'll go ahead and get started by sharing the screen. Good afternoon, my name
civil liberties in Mexico during his 30 years in power as an autocratic leader bent on establishing political stability in order to attract foreign capital. On the other hand, these activists struggled against American racial discrimination that constricted the lives of Mexicans in Texas, regardless of citizenship status. These activists understood both that the oppressions endured by Mexicans in Mexico and those suffered by Mexicans in the United States violated transnational liberal precepts. In Redeeming La Raza, Transborder Modernity, Race, Respectability, and Rights, I argue that middle-class activists sought to save La Raza, the Mexican origin community, from racism in the U.S. by redeeming them from a marginal status that denied their humanity. For these activists, the defeat of Jim Crow or Jaime Crow involved not just the transformation of a racist world, but the material, moral, and intellectual uplift of a people whom white supremacists considered inferior. While arguably reinforcing a modernist ethos of respectability with problematic gendered class biases, these activists simultaneously challenged stereotypes and caricatures of Mexicans as backwards primitives, incapable of civilization, and as a morally and biologically defective mongrel race. By using their educational and class-based privileges to present themselves as the educated, upwardly mobile, and sophisticated Mexicans they were, and encouraging others to follow their lead, they bravely challenged all of the rationale, all of the racist rationales that the dominant American culture used in order to justify inequalities in society. My argument is buttressed by a two-pronged theoretical framework. Social redemption as conceived at the turn of the century by these Mexican origin activists involved a struggle to eradicate racism and discrimination from society, as well as deal with other problems such as poverty. On the other hand, cultural redemption represented the intra-ethnic group effort by middle-class Mexican activists to uplift the poor, immigrants, and the working class materially, intellectually, and morally. It involved the countless individual conversions to modernity and respectable society that would be needed in order to uplift a colonized people from their subordinate position in the United States. Several key questions guided my research, but the principal question I was asking of the sources was the following. How do the privileged within marginalized groups exercise agency to advance the broader group struggle? Specifically, how did transborder activists deal with the racism, poverty, and violence directed at Mexican origin people? Transnationalism, nation building, modernity, social constructionism, identity and community, and various forms of political agency served as analytic frameworks for this study. Mexican origin people in the United States have been shaped by two worlds, a Spanish speaking one and an English speaking one, both products of empire, colonization, the enlightenment, the rise of nation states, and modernity. Possessing hybrid identities and often transnational lifestyles, these activists nevertheless engaged in nation building projects, be they Mexican or American. They understood that the nation state represented the modern form of political organization. Modernity and enlightenment thought greatly appealed to them because of their promises of liberty and progress. 
in Mexico, race could be mediated by class and other factors such as education. In other words, it became possible for mestizos and some indigenous people to succeed if they became modern, if they became national. Transporter activists understood this relationship between the Mexican state, modernity, and the social construction of the citizen and tried to replicate this dynamic in the United States. These activists believed that in Jaime Crow America, La Raza's best hope laid in their cultural redemption as a modern people with a national identity. While racism often took center stage for early 20th century transporter activists featured in this book, analysis of gender, class, nationality, and citizenship blend with discussions of race because these also informed identity formation, community development, and political agendas. These early transporter activists possessed a strong identification with the Mexican classical liberal tradition and its connection to enlightenment concepts such as the inalienable, inalienable rights of man. Early on, activists such as the Idars from Laredo identified racism as an aberration of the modern ideal of an egalitarian society. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness presented an American promise that other societies, including Mexico, through its liberal political strain, sought to emulate. Ironically, the high macro system that the Dars and other activists saw as a betrayal of modernity's promise found affirmation in modern scientific notions of evolutionary differentiation, natural selection, and the survival of the fittest social Darwinian thought, in other words. Indeed, modern science justified the movement from inalienable rights to conditional rights, creating a world where rights became the purview of those privileged enough to be socially constructed in ways that placed them at the top of the human pyramid. The political conjoined with the economic as scientific racism also conveniently served the needs of industrial society and agribusiness for cheap labor. Into this world, transporter activists entered and used their privileges to design strategies of cultural redemption and reform needed in the struggle against marginality. Challenging the white supremacist belief in the inferiority of Mexicans, these activists encouraged their constituents to defeat stereotypes by seeking the measures of respectability, becoming gente decente, which translates as decent people. Thus, unlike applications of the gente decente concept to describe privilege purely in the service of power, I argue that in the Texas context, it describes privilege in the service of a civil rights struggle. The gente decente tended to be educated and middle class, however, workers, especially skilled workers, could potentially join in. Indeed, reformers in Mexico as middle class moral gatekeepers sought to inculcate gente decente values and to integrate the working class and indigenous groups into, quote, civilized society as part of their nation building project. In Texas, the desire to modernize a marginalized group while still part of nation building, took on a different orientation because now the nation in question was the United States. And rather than nation creation, transborder activists involved themselves in nation recreation. In other words, the task at hand for activists was to de-racialize Mexicans, to decouple them from the so-called Mexican problem. This racist concept was a response to the white supremacist desire to deal with ethnic Mexicans as non-whites within the context of the Heron Volk democracy, the Anglo-Saxon racial state that relied on the black and white dichotomy. Not fitting neatly into 
exclusive black or white categories, Mexicans and many other groups have complicated that racial binary. They have destabilized the racial state with their claims to whiteness, their demands for rights, and their reimaginings of U.S. citizenship beyond the merely political to encompass economic contributions and cultural linguistic priorities. Ultimately, their greatest challenge to white supremacy has been their cries for social justice, their willingness to expose the underside of a modern democratic society. The transborder activists engaged in struggles for equality uh, resisted forces of oppression as individuals through organizations and by appealing to the Mexican government and or the United States government. Ethnic Mexican human and civil rights struggles in Texas and throughout the Southwest during the latter part of the 19th century and most of the 20th century can be studied using four categories of activist analysis, the lost land identification, Mexico Lindo generation, Mexican Americanism, and the Chicano and Chicana movement. Redeeming La Raza focuses on Mexico Lindo nationalism and Mexican Americanism. But I will begin by explaining lost land identification because doing so will help to explain the historical context that the activists I focus on were dealing with during the early 20th century. In the aftermath of the Texas Revolution and the U.S.-Mexican War, the political geography of North America changed dramatically as a new boundary between the neighboring nations transformed Mexicans in Mexico's lost territories into a transborder people. Firmly planted in their cultural homeland, the dire political reality of borderlands people severed from the Mexican nation state set the stage for a long-standing struggle for first-class citizenship in the United States. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signed by American and Mexican officials in the aftermath of the war, stipulated that Mexicans wishing to remain in their native land would become United States citizens with all the rights pertaining to such a status. However, the treaty was rarely honored in the post-war period, resistance to the new social order, particularly the unjust treatment of Tejanos, met with swift suppression. Two men of high standing in their respective communities, Juan Nepomuceno Cortina and Catarino Erasmo Garza, turned to militant resistance, seeking redress for the growing list of wrongs committed against Tejanos. The Texas Rangers, a state police force, often resorted to extra legal means in their efforts to carry out the suppression of these movements. In fact, while in pursuit of outlaws and Tejano social bandits, those who engaged in unlawful activity as a form of resistance, they often, meaning the Texas Rangers, often injured and killed innocent people of Mexican origin. Corridos, or Spanish language folk ballads, often made references to the detested rinches, as the rangers were called, and glorified men such as Cortina, Garza, and Gregorio Cortez, men who were categorized as outlaws by Anglo-American society and by the law, but venerated as heroes in the hearts and minds of many people of Mexican descent. Under Spanish and Mexican rule, Tejanos had enjoyed political agency, though elites had a stronger political voice than their working class counterparts. After 1836, however, Tejanos, regardless of class, were no longer treated as part of the sovereign people. They witnessed their own disfranchisement and relegation to a socially subordinate position. Throughout the 19th century, Tejano saw their rights erode as racism prescribed their lives. Tejano leader Jose Antonio Navarro 
was one of a handful of Tejanos able to participate in Texas state politics during the 19th century as he was considered a Spaniard read as white European. He fought against the Anglo-American exclusion of Tejanos from political participation at the Texas Constitutional Convention of 1845, where he was the only Tejano representative, Navarro argued against the use of the word white in the Constitution as a qualifying adjective for the franchise. He succeeded in this endeavor, and yet Tejanos in many districts remained either disenfranchised or at the mercy of political bosses. Where Tejanos voted independently, the threat of Anglo-American anger loomed constantly. Besides the outright denial of the right to vote, other mechanisms were designed with the same purpose in mind, such as the all-white primary and the poll tax. Economic expansion in the southwestern region of the United States and in northern Mexico created the conditions that led to immense poverty for many Mexicans in Mexico and Texas. The expansion of railroads across South Texas made it possible for new settlers from other parts of the United States to populate the area. This shift signaled the demise of the Spanish-Mexican ranching order. Some old Tejano families managed to hold on to their lands, but many lost these through both legal and extra legal means. New cities appeared and irrigation systems made agricultural development of the land possible. Former ranches and desert-like stretches of land became winter gardens as one particular area came to be known, producing fruits, vegetables, and cotton. Here are two images. One is of Juan Nepomuceno Cortina and the other Catarino Erasmo Garza. Uh, who among the ethnic Mexican community were revered for their defense of La Raza, but Anglo-Americans uh, and their legal structures considered them to be outlaws. Jose Antonio Navarro, whom I reference, um, who was influential in trying to protect Tejano rights within the Anglo-American political system. Unfortunately, he, he was the only one uh, who had some power to do this in the 19th century. The new Anglo-controlled farming economy came to depend heavily on Mexican labor, particularly immigrant workers. Between 1900 and 1930, the demand for cheap labor in Texas, as well as other parts of the United States, led to the recruitment of workers in Mexico. By then, the regime of the Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz had aided private landowners in dispossessing millions of rural peasants off their communal lands. Many of these dispossessed people traveled north in search of economic opportunities and came to fill the growing demands for labor in the United States. By 1910, Mexico's explosive social and political revolution displaced one-tenth of that nation's entire population, with most political and economic exiles settling in the United States, principally in Texas and California. A paradox took shape. Anglo farmers and other businessmen desired cheap Mexican labor, but Anglo society in general considered Mexicans a social pariah to be controlled and segregated they became known as the Mexican problem. But to transporter activists of the early 20th century, immigrants and the native born alike constituted a much maligned Mexico Tejano community in need of help. The influx of Mexican immigrants during the first decades of the 20th century created all manner of challenges for the state of Texas. In the realm of education, the growing number of Mexican origin students meant that the longstanding practice of ignoring the educational needs of Spanish-speaking children 
would no longer serve as the default position of the state. During the 1920s, Texas considered two strategies in dealing with these school children. One method involved an attempt to assimilate them via Americanization programs, which fell in line with the national Americanization movement championed by progressive era reformers. The second approach was exclusionist. The segregation of Mexican origin children was not based on constitutional or statutory grounds. Rather, it reflected the attitudes of local communities. Part of what historians call the Mexico Lindo generation, early 20th century transporter activists emerged within this world marked by systematic and pervasive discrimination against Mexican origin people. The problem, these activists argued, was the problem was not the Mexicans. The problem was the dehumanization and mistreatment of Mexicans by Anglo-Americans. This fundamental premise reveals their understanding of power dynamics within Texas. And yet, middle-class transporter activists also viewed the Anglo-Texan injustices committed against Mexicans through the prism of a gente decente value system. In other words, they practice a form of respectability politics meant to challenge negative stereotypes of Mexican immigrants in Tejanos. The Mexico Lindo generation of transporter activists relied on mutual aid societies, women's voluntary associations, and fraternal orders to organize themselves and command ethnic leadership. It was through such organizations that the first Latino Civil Rights Congress in the United States was organized. Motivated by various human rights violations of Mexicans in Texas, such as lynchings, school segregation, political disfranchisement of native-born Tejanos, the Idar family of Laredo mobilized Mexican origin activists throughout Texas and Northern Mexico into a Civil and Human Rights Congress. Some of the main concerns of the Congress included civil rights, cultural retention, and education. The first Mexicanist Congress took place on September 14, 1911 in Laredo, Texas, and it sought to unify Mexican origin people across differences of class and gender in order to build a political coalition. Congresistas also adhered to a community self-help philosophy that had a two-prong approach. On the one hand, they worked to culturally redeem La Raza, seeking to help people improve their material lot, develop their intellectual capacities, and strengthen their moral character. On the other hand, they worked to effect positive social changes in society, tackling issues of racially-based discriminations and poverty. Women, like men, participated in this first Mexicanist Congress enthusiastically. An offshoot of the Congress was the League of Mexican Women, led by Jovita Idar, Gente Decente women of the League framed their political participation in terms of benevolence, transforming their moral imperatives into a plan of action. Like other women in American society, Latinas often adhered to the belief that as mothers, they had a special responsibility to nurture and mentor the next generation. Furthermore, whether mothers or not, women had a mandate, they believed, a mandate to exercise a feminine authority in the public square on social issues of relevance to their families and their communities. This is the philosophy of maternal feminism, or simply put, maternalism, that motivated them. As educators, several of whom operated their own schools, league members kept the education of youth uppermost in their minds, but widespread poverty also commanded their attention. They sponsored literary readings and musical and theatrical productions. These activities generated funds for their charitable projects, such as providing free instruction and school supplies for indigent children. 
But the Mexico Lindo generation also included working class Mexican immigrants and their Tejano allies who sought to create labor unions to counter the economic exploitation many experience in diverse industries from the railroads to the agricultural fields to the mines. Some of these laborers found inspiration in the socialist teachings of Mexican revolutionary Ricardo Flores Magón, so their activism tackled class oppression, understanding racism to be the result of unequal economic relationships between Mexicans and Anglos and between the United States and Mexico. Middle class activists did not always make the connection between class and race, often focusing their efforts on specific issues such as school segregation and other forms of racially based discrimination. Secondly, while some members of the working class adhered to gente decente values, others critiqued the middle class for imposing a bourgeois value system on them. And here's the basics regarding the first Mexicanist Congress, which took place again in Laredo, Texas in 1911. Their major concerns, civil rights, cultural retention, education, and the League of Mexican Women was an offshoot of the first Mexicanist Congress. The League of Mexican Women, again, was composed of gente de Sente women, and Jovita Idar was a founder and served as the leader. They were involved in uh, benevolence, ver various charitable projects. Several of the women were educators, and they lent their services as school teachers to help working class children in their community. Here's a portrait of Jovita Idar, who was trained as a school teacher, but uh, devoted herself to political journalism, civil rights activism. She was also, in addition to the Mexican Feminist League, she was involved in La Cruz Blanca, the White Cross. This is her brother, Clemente Idar, who was also a journalist. Additionally, he was uh, a labor organizer. At one point, he worked for the American Federation of Labor, and he was one of the founders, early members of the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC. An image of Ricardo and Enrique Flores Magón, and I just referenced them, that um, they were more critical of the capitalist system and they understood the linkages between white supremacy and some elements of the capitalist, the global capitalist system. One major problem that plagued ethnic Mexican community was racism, segregation. These signs could be found in various uh, communities in Texas. This particular one, this one was uh, painted on the wall of a restaurant in San Antonio uh, in the 1930s, 1935 to 1937. But here are some other signs. The first one appeared um, in Dallas, Dallas, Texas, Lone Star Restaurants Association. The one at, at the very bottom, that's from El Paso, as you can see, El Paso, Texas. So this was a widespread issue, a widespread problem. Ostensibly, the Texas public school system should have provided education for all children residing in the state. However, as La Cronica, that's a Spanish language newspaper that the Idar family owned and operated, La Cronica readers learned from Clemente Idar's incisive expose on Jim Crow segregation. They learned about what was going on with the school, school children. Mexican origin school children were being left behind. They were relegated to inferior schools with less qualified and lower paid teachers. Adding to the problem, agricultural lobbies prefer to have young Mexicans working in the fields for low wages 
rather than in school acquiring the building blocks for a brighter economic future for themselves and their families. Using the press to instigate social change, Jovita Idar called upon her Spanish-speaking readers to take responsibility for their children's education. She also expressed concerns about assimilation. Idar worried that the drive to assimilate Mexican school children in U.S.-based schools deprive youngsters of their linguistic and cultural heritage. In an article on the conservation of nationalism, Idar agreed that learning English made life in the U.S. easier and certainly should be encouraged as this would be the language they would use to defend their rights. Yet, to lose one's native tongue would lead to the loss of group identity. Therefore, Jovita Idar called for the development of more escuelitas, private schools for Mexican children in the U.S. taught by Spanish-dominant or bilingual teachers. And here you see the contrast between the American school versus the Mexican school. And clearly the school that was designated for ethnic Mexican children was of inferior quality, older buildings that were often uh, inadequate. Here's a picture, an image of Leonor Villegas de Magnon, who was a friend of Jovita Idar. And Leonor Villegas de Magnon was the founder of La Cruz Blanca, the White Cross, but she was also a school teacher and she had an escuelita in Laredo. Okay, another major problem was violence directed at ethnic Mexicans and people of color generally. In the same way that African American men could be subjected to horrific forms of violence such as lynching, so too did ethnic Mexican men fall prey to the Texas Rangers, for example, pictured here. This is from the book, chapter one, page 15. It appears that the Mexican race is condemned to be the Jewish race of the American continent and to an eternal pilgrimage, first from north to south and now from south to north. This epigraph appeared in La Cronica, November 12, 1910. So clearly these transporter activists are very much aware of what is going on and the implications for ethnic, ethnic Mexicans as, as a whole. I wanna read you a little bit from my book. This joyless dictum that I just read you um, introduced an article entitled Barbarismos in the Spanish language newspaper that was published by Nicasio Idar in Laredo, Texas. The article discuss the recent arrest of 20-year-old Antonio Rodriguez by sheriff's deputies in Rock Springs. The guilt or the innocence of Rodriguez charged with the murder of Mrs. Lem Henderson, an Anglo-American woman on a ranch near town. His guilt or innocence will never be known. While he was imprisoned, a mob of Anglo-Americans stormed the jailhouse kidnapped Antonio Rodriguez, and they burned him alive. This incident was one of many instances of violence directed at Mexicans during the early 20th century. La Cronica denounced the savage behavior of the vigilantes and the inaction of local officials while highlighting the international implications of the Rock Springs case. On November 9th, residents of Mexico City took to the streets protesting Anglo-American aggression against Mexicans in Texas. Ethnic Mexicans could be subjected to violence from law enforcement, such as the Texas Rangers. But in addition, there were legitimate concerns about the racism and hostility that festered within some white civilian communities for plenty of ethnic Mexicans had met their demise at the hands of white supremacist terrorist organizations such as the KKK, vigilante groups, posses, and organized or even spontaneously formed lynch mobs. 
and here's a, a one a book that might be of interest in terms of this particular topic. In 1914, El Progreso, a Spanish language newspaper, criticized the Woodrow Wilson administration's military intervention in Veracruz. The Texas Ranger set out to destroy the office and printing presses of the paper, but found Covita Idar standing before them in defiance, daring them to knock her down. The Rangers backed away, returned when she was not around, and proceeded to destroy the building and equipment and arrest the workers. Why, at a time when the Texas Rangers were so violent in their dealings with Mexican origin people, did they show some restraint with Jovita Idar? Her middle class status, education, and civic leadership helped to explain this. But in addition, Jovita carried herself with great authority and exuded respectability. She and her siblings dressed formally, knowing that one way to combat stereotypes of Mexicans as dirty and unkept was to dress well and behave with decorum. Jovita Idar was not someone the Texas Rangers felt free to knock down. Here's a picture of Jovita Idar and others at El Progreso. Some of the uh, stereotypes of Mexicans as being violent, dangerous. And here's an image of Pancho Villa running barefoot with Uncle Sam after him. I don't ever remember seeing a photograph of Pancho Villa barefoot. He was always wearing boots in the photographs that I've seen, but that, that was the stereotypes. That, that's the way they saw ethnic Mexicans. And those stereotypes continued uh, into the 1960s and 70s with the Frito Bandito that was used uh, to peddle Frito, Frito chips. Okay, this was the motto of La Cronica. We worked for the progress and the industrial, moral, and intellectual development of the Mexican inhabitants of Texas. In Jovita Idar's activist journalism, we can see the concepts of cultural redemption and material uplift at work. La Cronica focused on this mission of uplift by also expending much energy on a crusade to expose injustice and call for change. In an article on the education of Mexican children in Texas, Covita Idar called upon the Mexican origin community to take a proactive approach in this matter because neither the Mexican nor American government had prioritized the preparation and future of their children. This quote encapsulates the cultural redemption philosophy that tolerance could potentially be achieved uh, through group cultural change. If Mexicans could become more educated, perhaps they would no longer be marginalized in the United States, or so was what they hoped. Jovita Idar was as concerned about negative stereotypes of women as she was about the negative images of Mexicans. Sexism, like racism, could be disarmed by calling upon women to empower themselves with the shield of education and the robes of respectability. In an article titled, For the Woman Who Reads, Idar promoted the idea that education elevated women and, by extension, men. By this standard, a woman's power rested in her ability to be pure and moral. Her sublime role was to inspire men to find their own moral compass and in this way contribute to civilization. As for a critique of the social structure that encouraged racism and sexism, as seen in Jovita Idar's call for Spanish language or at least bilingual instruction, she highlighted the inadequacy of Texas schools in this regard and the pernicious manner in which they threatened the existence of Mexicans as a national group. In terms of sexism, Jovita Idar did more than reassure conservative readers with Victorian notions of womanhood. A feminist line of reasoning also informed her thought process, defining the modern woman as one with ample horizons. The modern world needed modern women who, like Jovita Idar, had prepared themselves educationally, 
to make contributions in different arenas. Here is Leonor Villegas de Magnon once again. And as I mentioned, she was the founder of the White Cross. And the Jovita Idar, Leonor Villegas, Villegas de Magnon, and other transporter activists participated in the Mexican Revolution through this medical brigade, joining the forces of General Venustiano Carranza. Here's the two friends uh, bandaging a soldier, a rebel soldier, Carrancista soldier. Okay. All right, so Jovita Idar married uh, Bartolo Juarez in 1917. They moved to San Antonio and she continued her activism in San Antonio. She remained a devout Methodist and was very much involved with La Trinidad Methodist Church, but she was also involved with the Democratic Party. She uh, was involved also in uh, providing tutoring services and in mentoring people within the San Antonio community. So she was active until her last days and she died in San Antonio in 1946. Okay, so I don't have time to go into part two. Suffice it to say uh, that Part two of the book covers the period from 1930 to 1950, and this is uh, the section on Mexican-Americanism. So I have a chapter on uh, the Munguia couple. These are Henry Cisneros' maternal grandparents, Romulo and Carolina Munguia, who were very active in San Antonio starting in, uh, well, they arrived as political exiles in the mid-1920s and they became very active through the late 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, really until the end of their lives. Uh, and I have a chapter on Emma Tenayuca and her activist, uh, her reformist politics and her interest in New Deal liberalism and bringing economic rights, social justice for Mexican origin people in San Antonio. And the last chapter of the book covers the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, which was founded in Texas in 1929. There is a through line from the first Mexicanist Congress to LULAC because number one, the Idar, uh, the Idar brothers were involved both in the first Mexicanist Congress and they were among the founders of LULAC. And so some of those ideas that were part of the first Mexicanist Congress in terms of civil rights, cultural re retention, and a strong interest in educating ethnic Mexicans, those ideas also become very important in terms of the LULAC agenda. So there very much is this connection between early 20th century activism through the mid uh, to, through the mid 20th century with the work, the civil and human rights work of LULAC. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning in. We had some audio issues there, but we should have had them fixed. Dr. Gonzalez, are you on right now? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we're going to get your video going. My apologies. Okay. I think you can switch now to your video. There we go. Hello. Nice you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we have a few questions here. We have a couple of minutes. Um, we have a question from someone in the audience that asked, what generated your interest in transborder activism? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, it actually began a long time ago as, as um, a youngster, not seeing the history of Laredo, Texas, which is my hometown, represented in the K through 12 history curriculum. And even when I was a student, an undergraduate student at UT Austin, I never encountered the history of Laredo, South Texas, Hispanic Texas. And I was just curious about that because I knew we had a history. I had heard stories uh, from the time I was a young child from various relatives. And I knew that Laredo, Texas had a very proud heritage 
so I was just curious about that. Uh, and that sort of began the journey uh, of investigating that history. Wonderful, thank you. We have another question. Um, mm -hmm. How do we, um, as educators, leaders, uh, illuminate the stories of lesser known activists like Jovita Idar in our classrooms? I mean, I, I briefly, we talk about Dolores Huerta even here in Texas, not many people know who she is, but Jovita even less probably, right? Yes, although that's, that has started to change. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, thankfully PBS has included her in their celebration of the women's suffrage centennial and I was fortunate to participate in that. So that's available. Uh, also the New York Times more recently took an interest in Jovita Idar. They reached out to me and interviewed me and quoted me on an article that focused on Jovita Idar's activism and even Google um, took an interest in their Google do Doodle about a week or two ago, focused on Jovita Idar. So she's becoming more well known in terms of the mainstream. And I think that will continue. And people have been clamoring for, for instance, schools. They feel like Jovita Idar should have a school named after her. Some people want a movie about Jovita Idar. And so I've been sort of monitoring this interest in her life story through the social media networks that I'm a part of. Now, to go back to the original question about the, you know, the schoolroom and how to get these stories to our students. Fortunately, there are two curriculums specifically on Jovita Idar that have been developed. One of these curriculums was developed uh, by the Refusing to Forget project, which is very important because the Refusing to Forget project has been instrumental in getting uh, ethnic Mexican history, various historical actors that are part of ethnic Mexican history recognized by the state of Texas. So for instance, thanks to their efforts, Jovita Idar now has a Texas uh, Commission historical marker in Laredo, Texas, in San Pedro Plaza. Uh, for those of you who visit Laredo, you might want to check that out. But they've also excavated uh, the horrific history of the killings of ethnic Mexicans during La Matanza by Texas Rangers and posses, as I described in, in my presentation. So Refusing to Forget has done various curriculums on Jovita Idar and related subject matter. And that's easily accessible on the internet. Just type Refusing to Forget and it comes right up. And the other curriculum that has been developed more recently was by PBS, the American Masters series. Well, actually the the name of the project is on Ladylike 2020. And they're the ones that invited me and then they partnered with PBS to broadcast Jovita Idar's story and the story of 25 other trailblazing women that connect to women's suffrage, broadly speaking. And so if you go to the Unladylike 2020 website, um, you will find that other curriculum on Jovita Idar. So, and I, every chance I get, because I always get questions from school teachers when I do pu public speaking, uh, engagements and, and so on, I'm always approached about, well, how can I integrate this into my classroom setting? And so I point them to these two curriculums. And of course, people are welcome to read my book, Redeeming La Raza. The, the, as I mentioned, the first half of the book is all about the DARS and this transporter world uh, that I've been describing. Uh, I also have an essay that is about Jovita Idar. Uh, it's biographical in nature and that one can be found in uh, Texas Women, Their Histories, Their Lives, published by the University of Georgia Press in 2015. That's available on Amazon. And that's sort of the genesis for the political biography that I'm currently working on, because I feel that uh, Jovita Idar deserves a biography. We, we don't have too many biographies on Latinas and women of color in general. So I think that this is an area that I, that I want to continue to, to explore. Fantastic. We have a question from someone that's asking, what lessons does your book have for today's Mexican descendants, Texans, um, as Latinos are on the verge of becoming the largest demographic group mm -hmm. of the state? Well, I think there are several lessons that we can derive from this particular book and from other books and articles that have been published recently concerning the social constructions of race and gender and class. And so let's start there. 
race is a social construction. Okay, so people historically over time develop their ideas, their notions about this concept known as race. And unfortunately, it has been used in very negative ways to basically relegate entire groups of people into you know, substandard categorizations vis-a-vis -vis some prioritized standard, in this case, white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism. And this, this is nothing new. Right now, there's a lot of talk about white supremacist groups and all of that, but they actually have a long history. White supremacy has a long history in this nation and in other nations around the world. And so those ideas can be changed they're created by people and they can be changed by people through education. But the first thing is to recognize that they're socially constructed, they're not God given, they're not forever. And people can, can actually um, sort of untrain themselves to think in racist ways. They can untrain themselves to think in sexist or homophobic ways. These learned behaviors, they, people can make a concerted effort to move away from these. And so when you study history, I think one of the important uh, elements of history, one of the values of studying history is that you realize how people historically have been treated over time and how concepts of race have changed over time and how things that would have been considered by the mainstream acceptable in 1910 are not acceptable today. Even though some people might be doing these things, we castigate them for that. We criticize that. We say, no, this is flat out white supremacist. It's unacceptable. And we call them on it. But in 1910, the Jovita Idar and her associates it was much more challenging for them to take on white supremacists. They did it, but it was very dangerous. Um, and so those signs that I showed you in the presentation, they were in many places. And it's very rare now to see something like that. And when we do, of course, we take out our iPhone and we record it because it's so egregious. Uh, and so it's, it's not uh, socially acceptable by the mainstream as it once was. So. Studying history shows us the social construction of race over time. And I think it's a source of hope because it reminds those of us that are engaged in the study of these issues and in the struggle against racism, white supremacy, and so on. It reminds us that others before us have been involved in this struggle. And that even though there are still problems today, there have been some improvements and there have been some additions to the constitution, to American law that are there to protect uh, human life, to protect human and civil rights. And so it, I think it gives us a sense of hope that ultimately if we work together with other ethnic Mexican people, but also across uh, the axis of difference with other allied groups that also want to see an end to racism and sexism and homophobia, that together, we can achieve, uh, we can get closer to that democratic ideal, which is what human and civil rights, women's rights, labor rights activists have been working for for many generations. We have time for one more question. Um, someone is asking, what is the focus of your next research project? Oh, thank you so much for that question. I appreciate that. Um, I am working on the political biography of Jovita Idar. As I stated, there are not enough uh, biographies out there that focus on Latinas. And I think it's important to do so because while a book like Redeeming La Raza is interesting in the sense that it sort of presents the umbrella concepts of trans-border uh, activism, respectability politics, um, radical reform politics, which I also covered through Emma Tenayuca and the Magonistas, while it presents all of these concepts and that's important, I think we get even more engaged when we follow one human being's life, when we follow their biography. And through that person, through that woman or that man, we can see all of these themes play out in their life. And it's just, it, it's incredibly engaging. In particular, I think that biography can help our younger learners to, to become captivated by how somebody faced the challenges of their historical time period and what they did to survive and to persevere. And, how they were able to contribute um, in that broader project of working for human, civil, women's, and labor rights. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez, for being here with us um, and our viewers for joining us this evening. Uh, our Dismantling Bias Lecture Series kicks off with Dr. Allison Hobbs on October 21st at 6 p.m. Central. For more information to, um, and to register, please visit our we website at hmh.org slash events and please follow us at Inst on Instagram and Twitter at Boniac Center. Thank you again for joining us and thank you for tuning in. Have a great evening. Also, if you're in Texas, early voting starts tomorrow. So go out there and vote. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tovar. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you.